can't see. The creative team at Nikolai's Plant Adventures would like to acknowledge that we are filming on Treaty 6 territory at a Miskwaskigwaskwagen, also known as the Beaver Hill House. We would like to acknowledge and thank all the indigenous people of Turtle Island. We wouldn't be where we are today without their stewardship of the land and all their unique nations and teachings. I hope to honor my heritage and ancestors by passing down the importance of nature and storytelling through this show. We keep our cultures alive through the stories we tell, and I hope someday to hear yours as well. Miigwech. Hi, hi. It is mid-fall here at the Beaver House, and we just experienced our first snowfall. Most of the trees are pretty bare. You can see a few tiny buds, but all the leaves have gone. This one still has some leaves. See, three little leaves. This one still has most of its leaves. I wonder why. I appreciate that it's so colorful. I love all the reds, oranges, and dark browns. There's even a little bit of green. It's very beautiful. I wonder what will happen to all these things under the snow. Like this bark. Or these leaves. Or this big, long piece of grass. You can see the grains at the top. What will happen to all of this? I decide to investigate. There may be snow outside, but there's still so much more to learn about plants. Hi, I'm Nikolai, and I'm about to go on an adventure. Come join me. I live on Turtle Island. Turtle Island is full of unique plants and animals. There's so much to explore. Whether it's day, night, sunny or snowy, there's always something new to learn. I love learning new facts about my favorite subjects, plants, and nature, and ecosystems, and soil, and bugs. I love trying out new activities. I love finding new ways to move my body and make arts and crafts. But what I love most of all is learning new stories. Stories are the best way to learn. They can explain nature, give moral lessons, and just be fun. I want to learn as many stories as I can so I can write my own. Can you help me out with that? Awesome. Let's go on an adventure. Before I start a new adventure, I like to do some research. This helps me know what to look for when I go out on that new adventure. So far, I learned that decomposers play an important role in cleaning up leaves, grass, and twigs. There are two main kinds of decomposers, fungi and bugs. Today I want to look at bugs. I'll look at fungi, lichen, and moss another day. There are not many bugs out in winter. So I decided to go to the Royal Alberta Museum to learn more. Museums are a great place to learn new things and research your favorite topics. At the museum, I met up with Peter. Hi, I'm Peter Hewley. That's P-E-T-E-R-H-E-U-L-E. -E -E. I'm the live animal supervisor here at the Royal Alberta Museum, so it's my job to oversee the team of humans that look after our 250 species of live creatures we have here. Everything from insects and spiders to corals and crabs, uh, snakes and turtles, fish, uh, all the different living creatures we keep here are uh, my responsibility and that of my team. Hey 
Here in the bug gallery, we don't have a lot of our sort of local decomposers on display, other than, you know, a few sow bugs and, uh, and things. But if you look at some of the larger, more charismatic creatures we've got, like the giant African millipedes or the giant tropical cockroaches, we do have sort of our own local versions of some of these guys. So the millipedes, we have seven different species of millipedes in Alberta, and they're no more than maybe a couple of centimeters long. So they're a much, much smaller version than these very large African species we're displaying. And for the cockroaches, the only cockroaches we have in Alberta are a handful of the different house pest species that have found their way here. So they're really only living in human buildings. But it is important to remember that cockroaches in their home environment, when they're not being a house pest, uh, and there's 4,600 species of roaches in the world, um, these guys are really important woodland decomposers that are helping to break down those nutrients and not really a problem at all. So in your house, definitely don't want them there. But out in the environment, they have an important role to play. Now, if we were to start digging a little deeper into the garden, that's when you are down into the soil in the forest or wherever you happen to be, and you start looking at uh, maybe greater level of magnification, you look closer and closer, you zoom in, we're gonna start seeing a lot smaller creatures doing those jobs like mites, nematode worms, various beetles, all kinds of different creatures uh, fulfill this role as a decomposer. So I think it's maybe better to imagine it as the job that's being done than the actual uh, creature that's fulfilling that role. So these are all super important, but it's not as though, oh, it's only beetles who are decomposing. It's all different types of stuff and apparently any handful of soil should have like tens of thousands of small creatures living in there helping to break that stuff down. So if we imagine that there's that many things going on underfoot, there's a whole world kind of beneath our notice that's working to break these things down and make them into a form that the bacteria can use and then that converts into a form the plants can use. It's a very important role. Decomposers like millipedes, isopods, mites, beetles, all these other uh, creatures that are performing this role are essentially breaking down dead plant and animal matter they encounter. They're chewing it up, they're digesting it, and they're basically pooping it out in a form that's a lot easier for things like fungus and bacteria to break down. Now, although those are smaller organisms, it doesn't really diminish their role. They're actually super important because that fertilizer can really only be converted to a form that the plants can absorb once the bacteria have helped to break that down further. Um, so it's once the bacteria have had their, had their chance to absorb these nutrients and convert them into that form, then it's in the soil in a readily available format that those plants can suck up with their roots and start turning into new plant matter, new branches and leaves and bushes and trees and all those sorts of things. So when a tree falls down in the forest, whether you're there to hear it or not, there are all kinds of these creatures that are going to help working to break that rotten plant matter down. So that tree is now dead, the uh, the wood starts to soften, you've got all those different creatures we talked about getting in there, the millipedes and the sow bugs, there's all kinds of different wood boring beetles that go after decomposing dead wood as well. And they're eating that stuff, chewing it up, pooping it out, and then not only does that break it down into much smaller pieces, but it's also pushing it out of the tree and down onto the soil and where it's much more readily available for those other things like the fungus and the bacteria. Break that on down further, creates the, exactly that type of fertilizer. So we'll even do that in our gardens. We will add manure, right? Basically poop that's been composted and partly broken down. And that will help feed our plants and give them the nutrients that they need to grow, you know, big vegetables or whatever it is you happen to have in your garden. But of course that's happening in the, the natural ecosystems as well. That's happening in the forest. It's happening on the grasslands all over the place. And we can actually end up with really deep accumulations, of rich soil here on the prairies. Um, some of the, some of the richest topsoil in North America, and it extends really Really, really deep down there so we have we can certainly start planting crops and have success with them but it's because of all of that nutrient accumulated courtesy of those decomposers So as far as we know, the only life that we're familiar with in the universe lives here on earth and uh, even the fact that earth, soil, dirt can actually, I mean, we can use dirt or dirty as like a negative adjective that something is either of low value, it's dirt cheap, or that it's, it's, uh, you know, somehow disgusting, and it needs to be washed up and cleaned up. But, but it's, this is this earth, this soil, this dirt is what all of our plants grow from. It's what our ecosystems are based upon. It's, it's incredibly important. So I would love to see my fellow earthlings 
come to the conclusion that Earth is actually incredibly valuable and that to say that it's dirt cheap or cheap as dirt, uh, that's it really undervalues what's keeping all of us alive on this planet. Um, and I think coming, you know, coming to you here from planet Earth, let's uh, let's give it the value it deserves. It was so nice going to the museum today. I want to look up more things about isopods. When I looked online, I noticed this page from the University of Alberta. It's all about how to find and photograph isopods. There's not a lot of research about isopods here in Alberta and Edmonton, so the scientists at the University of Alberta want people to go find and take pictures of isopods so they can study them. Let's go through the sheet together. First, find some isopods. It's a good idea to look outside for isopods. They can be hiding under rocks, logs, soil, pots, bricks, pretty much anything. You can also find isopods inside, like the one I found in the classroom. You might even find one in your basement. After you find your isopod, gently pick it up and put it into the bag. Don't worry about the isopod hurting you. It can't bite or sting you. Once you have it in the bag, gently pull it so it holds the isopod in place. Then you can put a coin or ruler beside the isopod to show how big it is. When you take photos, make sure to take photos at the top of the isopod and at the bottom of the isopod. And make sure your photos are clear, that you can see the antennae and all the pieces at the bottom, including its legs and the back little piece, its lungs. After you're done taking your pictures, you can send them to the University of Alberta. When you send your email, make sure to share where you found your isopod the closest city to where you found it, and whether the isopod rolled into a ball or not. All this information will be really helpful for the researchers. It will help them answer questions like, are there more isopods in Edmonton or Calgary? Do isopods like living in the city or out in the country? Do they like logs or rocks more? Whether or not it'll roll into a ball will also help the researchers know what kind of isopod it is. Some isopods can roll up, and some can't. Roly polies, like the one we saw at the museum, those dark gray ones, they can roll up. But the common woodlouse and dairy cow isopods cannot roll up. Have fun looking for isopods! After you're done taking pictures with your isopod, make sure you put them back where you found them. We want to make sure that the isopods stay happy and healthy. We want them to go back to their home. Hmm, I learned so much today. What can I do? Hey, I got it. Nikolai's Guide to Making Your Own Creepy Crawlies. The tools you'll need. Wax crayons. Toilet paper rolls. Any size will do. Scissors. Cardboard sheets. I cut these out of old cereal boxes. And paint. First, prepare your paints. I put my paints on a scrap piece of cardboard. You can put yours on a painter's tray or dish. Next, dab your paints onto your toilet paper roll. If you have a big spot of paint, that'll be easy. You can do it in one go. If you have a small spot of paint, like I do, you can turn the toilet paper roll to get it all. Next, make your circles. You can make round ones or you can make ovals by squeezing in the sides. Next, color and design your bugs. I decided to draw a couple local bugs. 
First, I decided to work on a painted wood louse. Here I am putting brown in and the little yellow spots that go up their back. Finally, I put on their little leggies and some antennae. Look, I even put in all the segments. Next, I decided to work on a rice weevil. I picked this one because of how bumpy they are. It's interesting to see all the different textures of bugs. There, he's all brown. There's my rice weevil. Now I'm trying to get that texture in. I'm trying to make it look bumpy. It broke my crayon. <laughs> Oops. Let's try to get it in there. Hmm. Lastly, I made a Colorado potato bug. I liked all the stripes and splotches in its design. Here I am putting the stripes, adding the little antenna and legs, and then coloring it in with some reds and oranges. This one is smoother than the rice weevil. Look, there he is. I got all the stripes. Here I am trying to make some more bugs. I want to make another ice pod. I'm going to try and make one of my dairy cow ice pods. Here I am putting in the white, I'm trying to get it all covered. I try to do my best coloring and stay in the line. Next, I look at my hand to see where I should put the dots. There we go. Tried to copy it. Looks so cute. After an adventure, I like to sit and think about my day. Learning new information can remind you of old adventures and stories. Making connections between the information you just learned and something you already know can help you remember the information for the future. When Peter was talking, I made a connection to a Greek god I know, Hades. Hades is the god of the underworld. According to the myths, Hades is responsible for looking after everyone that died in Greece. Some people think Hades is evil because he is involved with death. However, the Greeks didn't see Hades as evil. Hades was just as loved and respected as any of the other Greek gods. The way people think about Hades reminded me of the way people feel about decomposers. People don't like dirt, bugs, and fungi because they think they are dirty and gross. However, they play such an important role in our ecosystems and growing plants. We should be showing decomposers love and respect for all the work they do. Just because something seems gross and icky doesn't mean that it's bad. It might be really important. By the way, have you heard of the myth of Hades and Persephone before? No? Let me tell you about it. Once upon a time in Greece, it was always summer. Demeter, the goddess of harvest, blessed the land each year with a good crop. Everyone had lots to eat. Persephone, Demeter's daughter, loved being outside in nature. She loved seeing all the plants and animals that came along with a good harvest. While Persephone and Demeter were enjoying the surface, Hades, the god of the dead, was lonely in the underworld. He didn't have anyone to talk to. He saw how pretty and happy Persephone was, and he wanted to talk to her. He went to the surface and waited until Persephone was looking at some flowers and kidnapped her. This made Persephone and Demeter sad. They missed one another. Demeter looked everywhere for Persephone. Eventually, the surface began to freeze and all the plants began to die. Zeus, king of all the Greek gods, asked Hades to get Persephone back. Hades wanted to. He could see he made a mistake kidnapping Persephone. It hurt Persephone and Demeter's feelings. But there was a problem. There's a very important rule in the underworld. If you eat food from the underworld, you must stay there. While Persephone was in the underworld, she got very hungry 
and she ate some pomegranate seeds. According to the rule, Persephone would have to stay in the underworld forever. However, Hades wanted to make things right and agreed to be flexible with the rule. Persephone could go to the surface for half the year and come back to the underworld for the other half. Everyone agreed, and according to the Greeks, that's why we have summer and winter. Did you like the story? I hope you did. Hades and Persephone is one of my favorite myths. I worked hard to make pictures that fit the story. I wanted to make my paintings unique, so I decided to use plants and fungi to represent the characters in the story. I picked a portobello mushroom for Hades. A portobello mushroom is a type of fungi. They are big and have wide caps. I picked a mushroom because it's a type of decomposer. On top of his head, I put pomegranate seeds to make a little crown to show he's a king. I made similar choices for the other characters in the story. For example, I picked an olive tree and lightning to represent Zeus to show how big and powerful he is since he's the king of all the Greek gods. I would love to hear what kind of connections you made during our adventure today. I hope you had a lot of fun with me today. See you next time. Bye.